good morning and welcome again to our worship time of our Lord and Savior today. In the way of announcements, uh, just several things I want to bring to your attention. Tomorrow at uh, 1230 is the prime timers meeting here at the church. Uh, Saturday the 21st is the ladies brunch and a uh, special note there about signing up as uh, probably is today uh, for that is you so that they know how many is attending so that they can be prepared for all of that mark on your calendars that Sunday May the 29th that Rick Horn will be with us uh, both in the Sunday school hour and uh, ministering the word of God to us in the church hour Getting, bringing us up to date in the Sunday school hour as to his work um, and, uh, and then ministering the word of God to us in the church hour as well. And I'll just remind you that there are sign-up sheets back in the back for different things, uh, lawn mowing, um, uh, praying for the men praying or reading scripture. Uh, and I thank Kathy for, um, she's well ahead of the game. We've got the schedule for for uh, pre uh, for reading scripture and praying right on through into next year already the dates are there so uh, uh, thank you Kathy for that and so uh, opportunities there for, for the men to do that so uh, okay yes Howard prime timers is actually Tuesday okay Tuesday at still at twelve thirty though right. 12.30, Tuesday, not Monday. Okay, here at the church. Uh, those are the things I want to bring to your attention at this point right now, and uh, the rest of the announcements and the, and the missionary spotlight for May there with Rawi and Nui in Bangkok. You can read for yourself, and uh, those things have also been sent out. And, of course, the prayer list that's there for you to uh, avail yourself of. <clears throat> In our worship time, as we come before our Lord to worship this morning, let us pray. Our Father and our God, again, we we just thankful for to you for who you are, Father, that you are all truth, that you are also omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent, that you are loving that you are gracious, that you are merciful. Lord, we thank you for your blessings and your goodness to us each and every day and things that we do not deserve. We pray, Father, that you would help us to come before you today to worship you in spirit and in truth, to put away from us all the other thoughts and activities of the past days and, and, uh, and even of this day itself so that we can solely concentrate upon the worship of yourself, that we can sing to you praises, that we can sing to you of his being the King of King and Lord of Lords, that we can hear the word of God ministered to us, that we can read the scriptures, we can pray, Father, to our Heavenly Father, and for that we just give you thanks, Father, that we can do these things in freedom, with no fear of persecution, what a great blessing that is in our, in our community and in our country. And for that, we give you thanks. And I just pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this morning, as I would like to read from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20 for our opening of worship time. We see in this passage of scripture that the true believer described in the first three chapters can be sure that they're going to be in a sport, spiritual war. <clears throat> Paul's giving both a warning about that war, but he's also providing us with instruction on how to win that war. 
by describing to us the armor that we need, that he's the only one that can equip us with to resist the assaults of Satan. We can have courage in waging spiritual warfare because not only has he equipped us for the battle, but we fight with the might of our king who has already defeated Satan by disarming the rulers and authorities and by, tr by triumphing over them on the cross. Let me read to you from Ephesians chapter 6, the armor that we are to put on to resist the Satan, to, decide, to, to be able to stand firm against him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me and open in my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And so let us come before God in our time of singing, as we sing, as we sing to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, and it's... Um, as we worship the king, as we worship together. And the, the thing that we need to see is it's, it's not about us, but it's about God. To, oh, worship the king, all glorious above. He's our shield and defender. Tell of his might, oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopies, his chariots of wrath the deep thunderclouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? God has been so gracious to us. It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. Frail children of dust, that's who we are. In thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. That's the comfort and the, and the encouragement that we have that we know that Christ has defeated Satan, that he does not fail us, and he will not fail us, and never has failed us, and will continue to guide and direct us. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. If you want to follow along, this we're actually singing it from the Grace Hymnal. It's in the Trinity, number 13. <clears throat> Let's stand together. Uh, the only difference is we only have four verses that we'll be singing from the Trinity, it would be one, two, four, and five. And there is a key change on the last verse. <clears throat>
Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 26 and verses 47 through 56. This is the betrayal and the rest of Jesus, and uh, there are several things that in this passage, particular passage that Christ had alluded to when he was meeting with his disciples or when he was with his disciples in the upper room when they were having the Passover feast that's talked about in earlier part of this chapter. But for our scripture reading this morning, we want to read 47 through verse 56. And while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so at that hour? Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. So ends the leading of God's holy word. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have poured out. We thank you for the blood that your son shed on our behalf. Father, we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ, your own dear son, was willing to come and be a servant, was willing to come and lay down his life and follow your will, Father, no matter what it cost him. And Father, we, we pray that you would help us as your people to understand these truths and to uh, make them our goal in life is to lay down our lives also, Father, to take up that cross and do the very things that you have called us to do. Help us, Father, to do it with a heart of gratitude. Help us to do it with a heart of joy as we do your will, Father, and find that in doing your will is our true fulfillment, our true happiness and joy in life, is being obedient to you, Father, and uh, surrendering all that we have, Father, surrendering to you in every area of our life. Father, in order for us to be of use to you, we must be broken bread and poured out wine but in order for that to take place, Father, we need to be transformed and your very spirit, Father, changes us, transforms us, shows us the areas of our lives that we uh, need to change, that we need to give up, that we need to uh, stop having our own way and sinning against you, Father. Forgive our sins, for we are indeed a people who still struggle with these things. Father, we are indeed a people that uh, need forgiveness, Father. We need your compassion and your mercy. Father, we thank you that you have given us a new nature. We thank you that you have given us the, your very Holy Spirit to indwell in us and uh, to convict us and convince us and to instruct us, Father. And may we indeed be people who are obedient, Father. May we indeed be people who are willing and pliable 
that you may use us and mold us and shape us however you see fit. Father, help us to uh, be people who look at our Lord Jesus Christ and we long, Father, to be like him. We long to be changed into his image and be more and more like him every day. Father, we pray that you would have mercy upon us as your people. We pray that you would have mercy upon us as this nation. Father, we look at our nation and our leaders and we see many problems and many difficulties, Father. We see much sin. We see our nation having uh, turned away more and more from the very truths of the word of God and have embraced foolishness and sin and gone after all types of terrible things, Father. We pray that you would indeed have mercy on us, Father. We pray that your word would now go forth in our nation in a way that it has never gone before with power and might causing many who are rebelling against you and who are sinning against you and living lives of open rebellion, Father, that you would indeed convict them, Father, that you would cause your truth to come in such a way that they would be convicted, they would see the foolishness of their lives, they would see the rebellion that they are living in, and they would turn to you, Father, and they would be in, indeed people who confess their sin and come to you, bow their knee at the cross, and our Lord Jesus Christ would have mercy on them, Father, would forgive them and bring them in to the very family of God. We pray, Father, that this would happen. We pray, Father, for people to proclaim the word, to bear witness to what our Lord Jesus Christ has done, to bear witness to what you have done, Father, creator of all things. We see the world around us. We see the whole universe around us, Father, and we are amazed at the splendor of your power and your might and your creation. And Father, we know that you have done it all. And Father, we are amazed at it. Please, Father, cause these truths to become uh, apparent, Father, to so many around who have rejected them and foolishly walked away, Father. Father, we thank you for uh, the knowledge that Roe versus Wade may soon be overturned. And Father, we, we know that this law has been a terrible law and it has caused the death of so many, Father, so many innocent have died because of this. There's been so much problems from it, Father, so much guilt and so much shame for people uh, who have had abortions, Father. Please have mercy on them. Help them, Father, to understand that you're a God of great love and compassion. Please, Father, bring this, bring this to an end. We pray, Father, that even though right now there's much division and there's much difficulty, much confusion, Father. May this be a very means for many people to see uh, the wrong that they've done, to see the sin that they've committed, and to see that they have gone in the wrong direction. Father, please help us to be the people that could reach out, people that could show love, people that could be kind, Father, and forgiving. We pray, Father, that we may be the people who you can use to reach so many people, Father, who are in turmoil and so many that are in pain, so many that are suffering. Father, we pray that you would indeed heal our land, Father. Help us to see the sin, to see what has happened, understand the ways that we've gone wrong as a people, as a nation, as a culture. Please, Father, Cause us to be convicted of these sins. Cause us to repent of these sins. All of this, Father, is because you are a great God and you give us the faith to believe. Without you doing that, Father, no one can believe. And so, Father, you are sovereign God over all things. And so, Father, we turn to you this day and we plead with our hearts, help, help us, help our whole land, Father, May the family again be strengthened. May fatherhood and motherhood be given the place that it deserves. And may a lot, all this foolishness and sinfulness be brought to an end. 
Father, you are the one who can do it. We love you, we trust you, and we plead with you, Father, forgive our sin and forgive the sin of all those around us and pour out your spirit upon us, Father, in a revival. May the gospel go forth with power, changing hearts, changing minds, convicting people of all this foolish rebellion that we see, Father. We see it, some of it in our own hearts, and we see it in others as well, Father. May you use this very thing to draw us close, to draw us to yourself, and to cause many to come to your Son, Father, and to call him Lord. We thank you for all your blessings, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together again and continue singing again to our Lord and King. And we need to rejoice in the fact that he is our Lord and our King. As we sing, rejoice the Lord is King and lead on, O King Eternal. And again, both of these songs again have key changes in the last verses.
please be seated. Imagine that you're standing on a mountain, surrounded by your fellow soldiers, and you can see on another mountainside, there the enemy stands. They've already sent their champion down into the valley where the battle will take place, and he is the tallest, most fearsome man you have ever seen. He's a literal giant. Who could defeat a foe like this? You're certainly not going to volunteer, nor to any of the men around you. And so the enemy champion comes out to taunt you, and he taunts your God as you wait for a champion to rise up on your behalf. And this goes on for many, many days. Then that day finally comes, and you see one has gone out to be your champion. He's walking down the mountainside into the valley. Wait a minute. He he doesn't even have armor on. He looks so young. Is he even old enough to be out here? And you you can hear the rumblings in the camp. This isn't a soldier. He's a shepherd boy. He isn't a soldier. He's an errand boy. He just came to bring his brother's food. This is your champion. If he wins the victory against all the odds, well, then you will be victorious as well. But who are you kidding? You've seen him with your own eyes. He doesn't stand a chance. And when he is defeated, surely you will be defeated with him. But what you don't know is that God has already anointed this man to be the future king. And although he uh, appears to be unfit and unprepared for battle, he's more ready than you realize. For he trusts not in sword or spear, but he trusts in the name of God. And on that day, David defeated Goliath, and God gave his people victory through his chosen king. David is not our focus this morning, but another man Another man who served as God's chosen king. A man who with meager forces went up against an unstoppable enemy to win a victory for others. And in this man, may God help us to see our king. May God help us to take confidence in our King Jesus, for he's the one who secured our victory. Would you pray with me? Father, there are some mornings where we find ourselves just feeling dull. Our minds don't feel very sharp. Our bodies maybe ache and are sore. And our hearts aren't as warm as we wish they were. We can feel as though we're going through the motions. In these things, we see our need for you. Would you be our helper again this morning as you always are? Would you give us an intellectual curiosity, Father? Uh, An intellectual hunger to understand your word? To know more of you? Where there are aches and pains, might you uh, take away the reminders of them in this hour that we would not think on them? And Father, would you... Would you spark our hearts? Would you give us that desire deep down within our spirits to hunger for you, not just to grow in knowledge, but to to grow in intimacy with you, Father, to know that in this very time that we are gathering in your presence, may it be our desire to see you in the word, to meet you here. And so would you give us an eagerness now that we would say, Lord, speak, your servant hears. 
Help us to receive your word with faith and love to store it up in our hearts and to practice it in our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Our text for this morning is Genesis 14, verses 1 through 16. Genesis 14, verses 1 through 16, and as always, always, I'd like you to turn there with me. And we've seen that God has made many wonderful promises to Abraham. But over the past few weeks, we've started to see those promises, at least as Abraham experiences them, they're, they're not going to come easily. They're going to come through trials and tribulation. First, there was famine in Canaan. Then there was danger in Egypt. Then there was conflict in Canaan. Lot's herdsmen feuded with Abraham's herdsmen, and Lot ultimately separated from Abraham. He left the promised land. We heard that he set up camp near the wicked city of Sodom. And this decision, which we saw was born of Lot's discontentment with the promises of God, today we see this decision has put Lot in danger. And it's also roped Abraham in as well. Would you listen carefully as I read, beginning in chapter 14, verse 1. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Keterlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Beersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemever, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Keterlaomar, but in the 14th, in the 13th year, they rebelled. In the 14th year, Keterlaomar and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim the Zuzim in Ham, the Imim in Sheva Kirathim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to In Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazan Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim with Keter Laomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abraham's, Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions and went their way. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol and of Anir. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. Aren't you glad that you didn't have to read this passage publicly? <laughs> it is easy to get lost in this passage. It's easy to stumble over these strange names and these strange places. And I'll admit to you that as I started studying this passage, this was one of those where I said, Lord, how am I ever going to preach this? What do I preach out of a passage like this? And so before we can ever sort of contemplate what this means for us today, we just we have to understand what it means. What's going on here? And essentially, this is an account of three battles. Uh, and I think it's going to make sense for us to look at them each individually. Battle one is what we see in verses one through four. That's battle one. And it shows us the victory, the first victory of the eastern kings. Verse one introduces us to a coalition of four kings 
And no, I'm not going to repeat their names. But outside of the Old Testament, we, we know very little about these specific kings. But we do know a little bit, at least, of some of their nations. The first nation mentioned is Shinar. Do you remember that? We've heard that before. That's where they attempted to build the Tower of Babel. It's the land of Babylonia. And right off the bat, this passage starts with a reference to one of the ancient and persistent enemies of the people of God. The first thing he mentions is Elam. That name means ancient servant. We would uh, recognize that name today as a portion of southern Iran. And the king of Elam, the, the main ruler of the Elamites, was a man named Shinar. Shinar means the Arabian desert and they would come down from the north into uh, to this Transjordanian region to conquer these five kingdoms. And of these five kingdoms, Sodom and Gomorrah are of particular interest. Especially Sodom because, oh, I'm getting a signal. What do I need to do? Put the mic up. This one is not okay. Okay. I'm going to put this one down then. All right. Are we good now? Okay. Hopefully I was projecting loudly enough that you, you got the gist of it so far. Um, of these five kingdoms, Sodom and Gomorrah are of particular interest, and that's because Lot has camped near Sodom. However, he, this battle probably took place before Lot had moved there. By the time he's moved his tent near Sodom, the kingdoms around the Salt Sea, they'd already been forced to become vassal states. And so they owe some sort of regular tribute, most likely, to these eastern nations. They have to bring resources, goods, uh, money, and send them to them to keep peace with them. And that's just the way it was when Lot showed up. At least that's the way it was for 12 years. But verse 4 tells us that in the 13th year, these uh, kingdoms that exist right outside, just on the, the, the eastern side of Canaan, that they have chosen to rebel. They're not going to send their tribute this year. You want your tribute, you want your stuff, come and get it, is what they were effectively saying. And they knew they were risking war. They had to have known that. And that's what they got. In verses 5 through 12, they show us battle number two. Really, it's a, a second military campaign. And it shows the second victory of the eastern kings. They're going to win again. The second victory of the eastern kings. In the 14th year, King Chad and his coalition marched back into this region surrounding Canaan. And verses 5 through 7 tell us that they conquered many other peoples. It's not just focused on these five kings. And in fact, if, if you look up in a Bible atlas, you look up these geographical markers, they weren't just battling on this eastern border of Canaan. They came down from the north, went through the eastern border, they were all the way under the southern border of Canaan. We are getting this picture of these eastern kings coming and conquering all this land surrounding the promised land. The text is also telling us that King Chad's coalition is an extremely powerful force. They look to be an unstoppable army. They're defeating the giants of the land. Deuteronomy 2, 10, and 11 identify these people, the Emim, the Rephamim, Rephamim as people of great height. Deuteronomy may also identify the Zumim in that way. Uh, to get some perspective on how big these people were, later on in Moses' day, we are told that King Og of Bashan was the last of the Rephaim. And Deuteronomy 3.11 gives us the dimensions of his bed, which may not be a reference to the bed he slept in. It may be a reference to his sarcophagus, his casket. It was, to put it in modern terms, somewhere in the range of 13 and a half feet by 6 feet. If you have a general idea of how big a king-size mattress is, just about double that in length. 
And this is what is referred to as this guy's bed. These were huge, fearsome warriors. But these eastern kings, the text is showing us they were tougher. They were stronger. And all of this leads to another showdown between the four eastern kings and the five Transjordanian kings. And the eastern kings win again. And what we see from the little details in the text is that the armies of Sodom and Gomorrah, they are routed. Their kings are humiliated, and the survivors literally head for the hills. And so what, what led to this? The king of Sodom, he wouldn't give the eastern kings their tribute. And so they've come to claim it for themselves. And verse 12 tells us that in the course of taking the spoils of war, they snatch up Lot and take him captive. Little did they know at this point that this was the decision that would lead to their defeat. It's kind of like in the movies. You ever see one of those movies where uh, the bad guy's doing his bad guy things and he just happens in the course of doing his bad guy things. He messes with the hero's family or he messes with the hero's dog and the hero would have never noticed the bad guy except, you know, now it's personal. Now it's personal. And by messing with Lot, King Chad has messed with Abraham. And so as we consider now verses 13 through 16, they show us the third battle and reveal the ultimate victory of Abraham. The ultimate victory of Abraham. Someone escapes and runs to Abraham, surely must know some of his connection to Lot, and he tells Abraham what has happened, and Abraham musters an army. As a wealthy man, Abraham had many servants, and he had many servants for many years, apparently, because some of those servants would have children. And when they had children, those children became Abraham's servants. They would be raised up in his household. History tells us that servants of this type would be particularly loyal. And Abram, his, his household has such wealth that he has 318 men who have been specifically trained for warfare. He, he, he likely then has over a thousand servants, but 318 who have been trained for war. So on the one hand, this shows us Abraham's great wealth. But on the other hand, this has to be a paltry army compared to the coalition of four kings from the east. Not just four kings from the east. These are giant slaying kings. And Abraham has 318 men. Later, Israelites might read this text and think of Gideon's small army of 300 men. Well, also like Gideon, Abraham and his small army were victorious. They used strategy to compensate for their small numbers. And we see that Abraham has caught up with King Chad at the northernmost edge of the promised land. We have that identifier of Dan. That's what the, la the city would later be called, the city of Dan. Abraham catches up with him, and he doesn't just chase him out of Canaan. He doesn't just leave him there at the, at the, at the doorstep of Canaan. He chases him beyond uh, the city of Damascus. And when Abraham wins against these kings, he brings back Lot, he brings back the other captives, he brings back their stuff, and finally someone has stood up to the bullies and actually beat the bullies. You say, all right, well, that's all well and good, but beyond a historical record, what's the point here? What, we, what are we supposed to take away from this today? And so while I've sought to explain the meaning, I think it's now time for us to try to contemplate the significance. What, what indeed does Christ have for us here beyond a historical record? To understand this, we're going to focus on some of the main groups and the individuals. We're going to start by first looking at Sodom and Gomorrah and their kings. Then we'll consider Lot. And we'll spend most of our time finally contemplating Abraham's role. First, Sodom and Gomorrah show us something about God's judgment on the wicked. Sodom and Gomorrah show us something about God's judgment on the wicked. And even as I say that, you may say, well, of course they do. And you're thinking to a later scene of God's judgment. But in this passage, they show us something about God's judgment on the wicked. In spite of the fact that the eastern kings are the aggressors, the text does not portray Sodom and Gomorrah as innocent victims. We have these little extra details in the text, and this is so important. As we try to understand narratives where we don't always have God showing up to say, I approve of this, I disagree with that, this is why I did this, we're relying on those extra little details in the text because nothing is irrelevant. We're saying, 
this is relevant. Why, why did God put these little details here? And as we look at some of these little details, I think they give us enough to infer that the onslaught of these eastern kings was a work of God's judgment on these wicked nations. It was a work of God's judgment. Previously in chapter 13, we were introduced to the wickedness of Sodom. Genesis 13, 13. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against Yahweh. We know that all fallen men are sinners. That's a given. But the scriptures are telling us that the people of Sodom, they were the worst of the worst. And in fact, this even seems to be reflected in the names of their kings. The king of Sodom's name is Bera. And those last two letters, R-A, uh, in the Hebrew, we have the, the Hebrew word rah, rah. It is the word for bad, the word for evil. It even sounds ugly, doesn't it? Rah. The king of Gomorrah is Birsha. His name contains the Hebrew word for wicked, Rasha. These are king, king evil and king wicked is part of their names. These kings and their kingdoms are clearly deserving of God's judgment, and that is what they get. And after their second defeat, they're portrayed in a way that's particularly humiliating. They appear to be fighting in their own backyard, this valley of the salt sea. And verse 10 talks about them falling into these bitumen pits, petroleum pits, tar pits of some sort. This could mean that they were so hapless that they accidentally fell in and died. It could mean that they were so ignoble that they threw themselves in and committed suicide. That's how Calvin takes it. It could also mean that they were so cowardly. The word for fall could, be, could refer to they lowered themselves. It could be an intentional lowering that they, that they lowered themselves into these stinking, awful pits, and that's where they hid. And our English translations, at least most of the modern translations that I looked at, they smooth this out. We, we didn't read the end of the chapter. We see the king of Sodom showing up again at the end of the chapter. And so I would presume, I think we're right to presume, that the king of Sodom does not die in this falling into the pits. And our English translations, uh, the ESV, what is the ESV? That some of them, some of them, there's not really that word some of them there. I think even the NASB might put that in italics to show you that they've added the word some if read most naturally, it looks like it's referring to the kings. The kings fled, and they fell. And so I would take it to be the third, the, the, the third one, the, the, the option that doesn't involve death, that the kings, as they were fleeting, the kings hid themselves in these stinking, awful pits while their soldiers ran for the hills. Either way, the text, it's shaming these kings. Is this how you want to be remembered by history? Of course not. This is shameful, and it serves as a warning to the wicked today. If you are opposed to God, he will oppose you. He will defeat you. He will shame you, and he will expose you for what you are. Wicked nations and their leaders should hear passages like this, and they should tremble and repent. For God will bring judgment, and that judgment may come as the sword. Do you remember King David when he had sinned and God gave him the option of choosing? Well, well what will be the penalty? How, how will judgment come? And David said, let me fall into the hand of God, not into the hand of man, because God is merciful. Uh, the judgment of an attacking army would be such a horrendous experience. And yet God uses wicked nations to judge other wicked nations. Do you remember Habakkuk? God said, Habakkuk, I'm raising up the Chaldeans in his day. Oh, these are terrible people. These are wicked, awful people, and God even affirms it. They all come for violence. The eastern kings played a role like that of later Babylon. These proud, wicked, tyrannical, power-hungry kings were acting as an instrument of God's judgment. And I think for those of us who are Christians, as we hear this, this ought to teach us humility in how we think and speak about international affairs. I think we desire things to be simplistic. Tell me who's the good guy. Who's the bad guy? Who do I root for? Who do I root against? 
Often there are multiple bad guys when nations go to war. And when we do see these things, when we see details, often we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know what the invisible hand of God is doing between nation, when nation goes to war against nation. We don't know God's ultimate purpose in, in, in this conflict that's going on, this extended conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And even when it resolves, however it resolves, even then we won't fully understand all the reasons why it was part of God's decree, part of God's providence. And I would encourage you that unless God has called your life into, unless he's called you into some specific calling where you have to regularly engage in international affairs, I would encourage you to keep in mind that you don't have to understand. You don't have to know everything. And even if God has called you, you, you still don't have to understand. You have to be engaged but we don't have to constantly give our attention to these things that the media and the internet is saying, oh, think about this, think about this, think about this. God has given us the perfect prayer for these times when we don't know what's happening when nation goes to war against nation. And it may be one wicked nation God is using to judge another wicked nation. God's given us the perfect prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's turn our attention briefly to Lot. Lot's appearance in this passage shows us something about Christians getting caught in the crossfire. Christians getting caught in the crossfire. Lot has been increasingly identifying himself with the city of Sodom. In chapter 13, he's moved his tent near Sodom. In chapter 14, the verb has changed. He's living in Sodom. He's dwelling in Sodom. When we get to chapter 19, we'll see he has a leadership role in the city. Lot the believer has sinfully and foolishly hitched his wagon to this worldly city of wickedness. If he had stayed in the promised land, it's very clear from this point, especially when we compare this with chapter 13, if he just stayed in the promised land, he'd be safe. But he chose to leave, and he's chosen Sodom. And thus he experiences consequences with Sodom. Now, I want to be careful here. Before I say any more, I want to note that I really think the emphasis in Genesis, and if we go further on even in Exodus, I think the emphasis is on how God saves his people from ultimately being judged with this world. He saved Noah and his family from being destroyed with the world by the flood. Later, he is going to rescue Lot from being destroyed with Sodom by fire. He preserved the Israelites in Goshen when he destroyed Egypt with the plagues. We have to remember the blessed truth that our God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not denying that at all. But we must not miss the fact that if we sinfully hitch our wagon to this world, we expose ourselves to sharing in the temporal consequences with the world. The Christian, let me give you some examples. The Christian who knowingly marries an unbeliever the Christian who pursues employment in an industry that is saturated with sin. The Christian who seeks friendship with the world. None of these people should be surprised when they experience consequences with the world for their walking in the way of Lot. Now we need to be clear on the purposes of such consequences. It may be the same consequence. Lot was dragged off into captivity, I'm sure, with many other wicked people, people who are unbelievers who did not have faith in God as Lot did. The consequences externally on the surface look to be the very same. And yet for the wicked, God is bringing a punitive judgment. But for the righteous, that same act, that same consequence serves as an act of corrective fatherly discipline. God brings these things upon us for our repentance, and for our preservation. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This whole experience should have been a wake-up call for Lot. Lot, what are you doing? Lot, change your course. If you've hitched your wagon to this world, this should be a wake-up call for you. What are you doing? Maybe God has sent consequences into your life to get your attention. That you're sinning, you need to change your course. 
Now we turn our attention to Abraham. And in this passage, Abraham shows us something about the victory of God's king and his people. It shows us something about the victory of God's king and his people. Now, it's been a few weeks since we looked at God's promises to Abraham. But do you remember one of the things that I tried to demonstrate is that these promises pointed to God's intention to bestow a kingly stature and a kingly prestige upon Abraham. In promising Abraham a land and a great nation and a great name, God was promising to make Abraham like a king. Indeed, the only two people that we have in the Old Testament who are promised by God, I will make your name great, are Abraham and David. And Abraham, had he inherited, had he inherited all these things that were promised to him within his lifetime, it could be argued that he would be a literal king. But because some of the promises would not be fulfilled until later to his offspring, you can't be a king without a land. Kings have lands. Abraham could not be a king in his day, but he was like a king. We're reading of him going to war with kings. This passage is showing us Abraham as a king, like a king. He's greater than the wicked kings who lived on the other side of the Dead Sea. He's greater than these tyrannical kings who came from the east. And his greatness isn't just shown in his might and his military prowess. It's shown in his purpose. It's shown especially in his purpose. Unlike the nine wicked kings with their proud and sinful intentions, Abraham joins the fray for the sake of justice. He fights to rescue the captives, particularly the captive people of God, his nephew Lot. And this is the type of leadership that a godly king must possess. We hear this ring out in King's, King David's final words. Would you listen to 2 Samuel 23, verses 3 and 4? The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, God's king must rule with justice. Ruling in the fear of God, he must rule in the fear of God. He must know the true God. And honor him in his ruling. Verse 4. He dawns on them like the morning light. Like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning. Like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. God's king brings justice to the oppressed. He comes to the aid of the vulnerable and the afflicted. When he goes out to battle, it is not a selfish and senseless war of aggression. It is a just war ultimately for the sake of peace. And when, when God's king wins the victory, God's people share in the victory. Lot didn't fight for himself. Lot didn't go to war. Lot didn't win anything. Abraham, acting as God's king, won the victory, and Lot shared in the victory. And from Abraham's kingly actions, we should see several things. The first is this. It should have served as an encouragement to Israel in their warfare. And I think this, even though this isn't a modern application, I think this is helpful for how we read the scriptures. We, 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 when we see these things, it should open our eyes to understanding the Old Testament. Israel should have been encouraged by this. One of the things that's easy to miss in this text is the way that Abraham's life foreshadows the future of Israel. If you missed previous sermons, this is nothing new. We've been seeing this week after week. We've been seeing it since Abraham left Haran. Consider these similarities that we see in this passage and with Israel, later Israel. When Israel's time of wandering came to an end, they would prepare to enter the promised land, and they would enter by taking the reverse course that these eastern kings took when they came down. There's this path known as the King's Highway. That's what it's referred to, I believe, in Deuteronomy. Um, no, Numbers, actually. Uh, the King's Highway, and it's this historic trade route that ran north-south parallel to the land of Canaan. That's what the eastern kings have come along. That's what Israel, God, would lead them along this path. And not only that, before they entered the Promised Land, they were going to have to defeat some of the descendants of the foes that the eastern kings defeated. They would have to go to battle with the Amorites. They would have to defeat, I already mentioned him, Og. They would have to defeat the Rephaim, Og. When they finally entered Canaan, they would have to do battle with giants. Do you remember that's why they were afraid to enter Canaan in the first place? They're so big, we're, we're grasshoppers in their sight. They, they feared these giants. 
they are going to have to do battle with the types of people that the eastern kings defeated. The eastern kings were giant slayers, but they are not the model for Israel. Abraham is the model, and he's even greater than the eastern kings. Abraham is the slayer of the giant slayers. And so in this passage, God is saying to Israel, Israel, don't fear the giants. You're the children of Abraham. And when the God of Abraham is with you, you are even greater than giant slayers. And we see later on in the passage when the eastern kings dared cross over. The only mention we have of them crossing over into the promised land is this brief mention of Abraham driving them out of Dan. Israel, look. Abraham drove them out of the promised land. Complete the conquest. Finish the job. Look at your father Abraham and see that God has been, he's been symbolizing, the, the, your victory is secure. Well, secondly, Abraham's victory, his, his kingly actions here are meant to serve as a revelation of Christ's victory. He's meant to serve as a revelation of Christ's victory. Like Abraham, Christ faced a foe that appeared to be unstoppable. Think about it. Think about how long Satan had sway. He deceived our first parents. He defeated them. And from that point, he took the whole human race captive. This is who Christ is going against. Someone that no mortal man has been able to defeat. Like Abraham, Christ appeared like the odds were against him. How often in Christ's life on this earth does he look like somebody who, who can defeat an unstoppable enemy? What does he look like as he's headed to the cross? He looks like a weak man who's been betrayed by his friend. His battle is going to lead him to death. That doesn't look like victory. His, 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 ba his, his battle leads him to shame, dying a criminal's death. That doesn't look like victory. He appears like the odds are against him, as Abraham did with his mere 318 men. Like Abraham, Christ went to battle to rescue the captives. Do you believe that he was victorious? Do you believe that Christ is your champion? Do you believe that he has set you free? We look around this world and look at our own lives. It doesn't always feel that way, does it? It doesn't always look that way, does it? I want you to notice one more thing about Abraham because I think it will help us to understand Christ's victory. Notice how Abraham did and did not exercise his military prowess. He engaged in battle to rescue the captives. He's defeated these eastern kings, and yet he doesn't engage in battle with the Canaanites to take possession of the land. If Abraham is so strong, why doesn't he just take Canaan now? God's promised him the land. God has even told him, walk around the land, stake your claim. And yet Abraham does not yet take the land for himself. Because according to God's decree, the victory will take place in two stages. In Abraham's day, the victory is secured. It is, this is demonstrated both by God's promises and by this symbolism of Abraham that we see in Abraham. He, he, he is one who can rescue the captives. He is one who can drive out foreigners. The land is not yet possessed, but it is secured. In Joshua's day, the victory will be consummated. And we ought to see Christ in this. In Christ's first coming, he came to secure the victory, not to consummate the victory. He came to secure the victory, not to consummate the victory. Does not the whole world belong to Christ? Surely it does. He made it by himself and for himself. But by God's decree, the victory will take place in two stages. That's why Jesus tells Peter to put away the sword. He doesn't need Peter's sword anyway. He could call legions of angels. But that wasn't the mission of this first coming. He didn't come to claim the earth all at once. But he came to secure the victory by establishing the new covenant, this covenant of grace. And Abraham, in our text, he portrays what the later prophets would prophesy. 
here's what your king will look like when the true king comes. This is what he's going to look like. He's going to fight and he's going to win a battle. It's going to be a spiritual battle. And he's going to rescue the captive souls of his people. And thus we must look at the cross with the eyes of faith. This is not the place of Christ's defeat. That's what the eyes of flesh tell us. But the eyes of faith tell us that it is the place of victory. In Colossians 2.15, Paul tells us that it was through the cross that God in Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. We often emphasize that Christ died to pay the penalty for our sin. We emphasize that he bore God's wrath in our place. Those things are true, and we must never deny them. But we must also recognize that when Christ died to forgive for the forgiveness of our sins, that he was also rescuing us from our captivity to Satan. This is how the author of Hebrews puts it. This is Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. When we were bound in sin, living under God's wrath and living under that fear of death, we were pawns and captives of the devil. But in Christ's redemptive death, he's forgiven our sin. He's removed that fear and that sting of death and thereby he set us free from our captor. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would your evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Friend, have you experienced Christ's salvation? Have you ever felt burdened by that sin that you just keep committing, that stuff that you know is not good but Yet you feel enslaved by it. You cannot defeat it on your own. Have you ever feared that death that you cannot avoid? Are you aware that you're being held captive by an enemy that you cannot defeat? He is too strong for you. Jesus is greater than the devil. Jesus is God's chosen king who came to rescue his people from captivity and to lead them to victory. And so you don't have to fight to free yourself. That is not the gospel message. If you fight really hard, you can be like Jesus and you can beat this enemy too. No, you're helpless like Lot. You need someone to come rescue you. Your sin has endangered you. God doesn't ask you to fight. Jesus has already fight the battle. He has already secured the victory. God doesn't ask you to fight. He says, trust in him. Look to him as your victorious savior and as your victorious king. And for all of us whom God has brought to trust in Christ in this way, we must continue to trust that our victory is secure and that it will be consummated when Christ returns. Finally, finally, Abraham's victory in warfare serves as an encouragement to the church in her warfare. This should be an encouragement to the church in our warfare Remember that in many of these passages, Abraham is functioning both as a type of Christ and as an example of one who has faith in Christ. And as Abraham engaged in warfare, so too does the church. When I speak of the church's warfare, I am not speaking of physical warfare, although I think it's helpful to note this very quickly as a quick parenthetical comment. I don't think that this passage is entirely irrelevant. To our thoughts about physical warfare. I think this is one of those passages that can contribute to our understanding of what constitutes a just war. To a lesser extent, I would even say to a much lesser extent, I think it might give some limited insight regarding the believer's role in acting physically to defend and protect the lives of the oppressed. But as individuals, as private citizens, we must not read too much into this text because, as I've tried to demonstrate, Abraham is functioning like a king and as a type of Christ, not as a private person. So we should not look upon Abraham's engagement in war as a model of what we might call some sort of Christian vigilantism. That's a contradiction in terms. 
and it's not the point of this passage. Rather, this would be a wonderful passage. Let kings and rulers and representatives to whom God has entrusted the sword, let them study this passage and carefully learn to do justice. And we can take a passage like this and pray for our leaders, those who have to make decisions about warfare, and pray that they would do justice. But we are concerned primarily this morning with the church's warfare, which isn't physical but spiritual. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4 For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And you might ask, if Christ has won the victory, if he secured the victory, why does the church engage in warfare? That's a very good question. Christ did secure the victory on the cross. He was victorious And yet you and I were not there. We were not at, we did not yet exist at that place in time. And we, I want to be careful in how I say this. We were there in Christ. When we come to be in Christ, we were in Christ. And yet we weren't physically present though. And as the church, or as Christ sits reigning in the heavens, his spirit is with his people today and he's applying the victory. Christ secured the victory in time and space for believers who did not yet know of Christ The Spirit is applying the victory. He's supplying the victory that Christ has secured through the proclamation of God's word. The battle has already been fought. The victory has already been won. We go out and we announce Christ's victory. And as we announce it, the Spirit applies that to the heart of God's people. We're not fighting a fresh battle. The victory in our warfare does not depend on us We get to rest in proclaiming Christ's victory, for we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let me give you some quick examples. When we evangelize, that is spiritual warfare. When God leads us to one of his people, that's where the spirit comes, is where the word is is being proclaimed, and they're being told that the victory is in Christ. The spirit is applying the blessings of regeneration and saving faith and justification and adoption. And we can evangelize with confidence because Christ has bound Satan. He secured the victory. Satan is bound so that the nations can no longer be deceived. When we preach and teach to believers, it's spiritual warfare. Every Sunday morning when we gather, this is spiritual warfare right now. We are using, with God's help, we're using Uh, his word, these divine implements, these divine implements of warfare. So as the spirit goes out, as the word is proclaimed, to apply sanctification to God's people, tearing down those strongholds in our minds of lies, of false doctrine. I get to preach with optimism. You get to listen with optimism because the victory doesn't rely on whoever is standing in the pulpit. The victory It's already secure in Christ. The man in the pulpit is just a workman, but God gives the growth. Because the victory is secured but not yet consummated, we must understand that our enemy is still active. He is restrained, but he has not yet been destroyed. He still lobs fiery darts at us. Like the serpent, he would love to deceive us. As the roaring lion, he would love to intimidate us. And so every day for the Christian is spiritual warfare. Don't don't think of it. Some of us need to have our minds retrained, corrected by God's word to understand spiritual warfare isn't this kooky, spooky thing that happens occasionally when you think a demon's doing something to you. It's an everyday thing for the Christian as we take up the armor of God and walk in the armor of God that our brother Ron read to us about earlier from Ephesians 6. Where does that armor come from? Not one bit comes from us. It's all been provided through Christ's victory. Are you living in the victory of the king? As with Abraham, God calls his people to engage in war, but the victory is not on us. Think about this. If God could give Abraham the strength to slay the giant slayers, what things could he do through his church? What things might he do through this church today? For we've been empowered with all power according to his glorious might. 
Imagine yourself on a hill. You're on a hilltop. It's the scene of a gruesome execution. Three men on three crosses. The man on the middle cross is your champion. The only champion you'll ever get. But he barely even looks like a man anymore. He's been beaten so badly that he's unrecognizable. He's been humiliated in every way conceivable. Soldiers spit on him. Criminals jeer him. There's a placard above him that mocks him as the king of the Jews, and they've twisted together this cruel crown of thorns, and they've shoved it on his head. This doesn't look like victory. But the eyes of faith can see what the eyes of flesh cannot. He's conquering. The man on the middle cross is winning. He's disarming the spiritual forces of darkness. Right now, he is exposing them and he is shaming them. He has bound Satan and he has been rescuing the captives. He's been plundering Satan's house. No more will Satan be free to deceive the nations. For the man of God will bring his captive people home safely. And one day we'll see him coming on the clouds, and on that day we will sing, Who is this that comes in glory with the trump of jubilee, Lord of battles, God of armies? He has gained the victory. He who on the cross did suffer, he who from the grave arose, he has vanquished sin and Satan. He by death has spoiled his foes. He is God's chosen king. He is our champion. And our victory is in him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you have done in Christ, for what you are doing in and through Christ and by your spirit. Father, might we rightly understand Christ's victory as we continue to read about our brother Abraham might we rightly understand how he shows us the strength of the victory that Christ has won for us. Help us to live in that today, we pray, for your glory. Amen. Stand in closing. We need to ask ourselves the question that we're going to sing in this last song. Am I a soldier of the cross? Are we a soldier of that cross that Mike has just portrayed to us of one who hanging on that cross who is humiliated and shamed? And are we willing to fight? And I think so many times we're not. Are we a follower of the Lamb? Are there no foes for me to face? May I must not may I must I not stem the flood? I'll bear the toil, endure the pain supported by thy word. Let's sing together. Am I a soldier of the cross? And think about the words. <clears throat>
And in closing, hear these words from 2 Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.